All right, now on Zero Block Thirty, we're privileged to have somebody who is living in Ukraine right now. He's an American citizen, but he's living in Ukraine and is doing all types of reporting on the situation between Russia and Ukraine. We've been talking about it a little bit on DBT the last couple of weeks and trying to brush up, but we wanted to go someone that actually lives there, that has been studying this for a long time and is an expert in the field. So we brought on Terrell Starr, who is doing great things in the field. I saw a video this morning of you on Twitter, and it really cut just the video of you being in the town square in Kiev. It really changed my perspective because I think a lot of times the American psyche is Ukraine is one spot. It, it exists on a tiny little spot on the map and everything that happens in Ukraine All happens in the, breaking loose everything right happens now. in it's the insanity. same neighborhood. Yeah. Seeing that kind of, I, I like took a breath when I went, I went, oh, okay. All right. So what's so the can real? you kind of walk us through what you've been seeing and just give us a primer on the, I guess, the relationship between Ukraine and Russia as it stands now? Well, thank you very much for having me on the show, first of all. I, I always take it as a, an honor any, anytime someone thinks that I'm worthy enough of, of taking any of their time to explain anything. So again, thank you very much. Um, but, but to give you a primer, basically the abridged version of it is that uh, what people know in the kind of uh, somewhat um, recent memory is that Russia invaded Ukraine back in 2014. But the reason why was because the, um, the, the, the then government of Viktor Yanukovych uh, decided that he would not sign a, an agreement with the European Union that would strengthen its political ties. This happened back in late 2013, but the invasion started in 2014. Um, Yanukovych was thrown out of the government Precisely because he was uh, he was overthrown basically by a, a protest by protests that became violent when the security forces shot into the crowd. That's important context because uh, the annexation of Crimea and the occupation of Luhansk and the Donbas regions in eastern Ukraine occurred under this false premise of protecting Russian citizens, based or Russian speakers. And um, by Putin, that was the accusation, which is ironic because the vast majority of people who have died in this conflict, be they civilians or be they soldiers, have been Russian speakers, right? And so he's creating, and, and that's all these things are verifiable. So, so basically, he not only invaded on the false premise of protecting Russian speakers, uh, the war that he created killed, you know, and, you know, when you look at the tallies, the vast majority of those folks were from Russian speakers or from Eastern countries, you know, and so basically, what you have right now has been a, a frozen conflict that he created since 2014. And the escalation of this conflict has occurred over another false premise that Putin is making, which is NATO is threatening our regional security. Now, I'm working on a several articles about this, and I know that you both have seen my tweets where I talk about uh, being a progressive myself. And you know, somebody who has my own reservations you know, I'm very much an anti-imperialist, right? I'm mm -hmm. also somebody who definitely speaks out against overreach of America, the, you know, the Monroe Doctrine, all these things. I believe that America needs to completely recalibrate not only um, it, it, its military posture, but just the way that American foreign policy takes place. And so what's happening with, but what's an exception here as opposed to Iraq and Afghanistan and Iran, which was cited in Bernie Sanders' recent column about this issue yesterday, is that Putin is operating, you know, the, the thing about NATO is that the political culture of the countries that surround, um, that are close to Russia or Russia's, you know, sphere of influence being, you know, the former Warsaw Pact country, you know, Poland, et cetera. Then you have um, the former SSU countries, particularly former USSR countries with the Baltics up in the North, is that these countries wanted to join NATO because they felt like their militaries were not strong enough to fend off a Russian invasion on their own, and because they all were colonized at one point, you know, during during their country's history, and so what you're seeing right here, right now, are these, you know, with this with this conversation about American troops being deployed, you know, for example, mm -hmm. to Eastern Europe, you mm -hmm. know, and it's just a few thousand, and they're doing that for the purposes of if some, if we have to, you know, evacuate people, for example, you know, those things take place because if you because you know this whole talk about NATO you know, forcing their hands or rush, you know, the number of troops that are deployed in these um, regions are so infinitesimally small compared to Russia. 
that right. is not remotely capable of, of, of a military offensive. So the people who are making these claims don't understand how military operations work. That's the that's one thing. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, I'll just stop there. But that's but that's kind of like a, a bit of a primer. I can get into more details with Germany and the EU and everything, but that's just kind of what's happening. No, I think it's important context to understand the last couple of years, because we even just re- mentioned uh, about two weeks ago on this show, we mentioned the number of Ukrainian soldiers that have been killed in the conflict since 2014 at 14,000. I don't think that most Americans realize that or put that into context comparatively to what we've lost in the war on terror. It's, it's yeah. more I than no, twice I was shocked. I had no idea. Um, yeah, and, okay, yeah. And what is the general, because I was surprised to see, like, you're right, in the news, it kind of seems like everything's chaos and this incredible tension. And you're you're walking the square in Kiev, which you said it's hundreds of miles away from, but people seem relatively calm. What is among the people there right now? What is the sentiment? Are they scared or are they kind of just living life as usual? Like, oh, nothing's going to happen. I feel like Ukrainians you know, can't say they're scared either. I feel like that's very Yeah, good. it's not a Ukrainian vibe. You got to. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. But, but, but Kate, you, you asked a really excellent question and it's complex because people are so used to this th- threat happening or not happening that they can't, regu- they, they can't live their lives predicated on whether or not Putin's going to do something or not. Yes, there's some anxiety here with, amongst people. with my friends, for example, people have made plans. Uh, if I have to evacuate, this is where I'm going to go. So there are plans. People just have it in the back of their minds. And so once that becomes necessary, people are ready to mobilize. And then you have some civilian units here, you know, that are preparing, you know, to, to defend themselves. And, and they're working in concert with the um, Ministry of Defense to create a civilian, uh, you know, create civilian regiments around the city. So it's very serious. And people are taking it, this, um, you know, with, with, with the seriousness that it deserves, the... But on the other hand, when, when I was posting that video, I just wanted to give people a general flow that daily commerce is taking place. People are still going back and forth to work. People are not really upending their lives in, about this because what can they do? Their homes are here and all of their livelihoods are here. And I think in America, we are so pinned to our news cycle that focuses on what is going to make people uh, gain attention. And so, of course, you're going to show videos from the front. You're going to show the geopolitics that are taking place because that is what determines whether or not the people walking down the street are going to go as usual as they are versus the evacuation. So it's important. Mm-hmm. But the reality of it is that what can folks do? I was asking my Russian teacher today. I was, even when I was taking that, when I was shot that photo, I was just coming from class. And yeah. The, and the, looking uh, dynamite too. You have the best jacket <laughs> game we, we both of said, anybody. I as was soon like, as K locked down, I was like, did you coat? see his jacket? Red and white. <laughs> it's great unbelievable. Coat. I would look uh, like such story. a clown in that Terrell. Such and a clown. And you look amazing. <laughs> but thank you. It depends. But the thing about it is not about the about the clothes wearing you. It's about you wearing the clothes, and that's yep. a very uh, that that. And so clothing is about how you present yourself to the world. But yep. you know, and, and the thing about it, and I'm gonna, and I'm happy you brought that up because that goes back into. The, the 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 just the vibe here is um you know I go about my day and right outside this window right here I'm in downtown Kiev this is where I live uh, part because I live here part time and I live in Brooklyn part time so I go to I, come, I go to both places when I'm not in uh, Central Asia and Uzbekistan for example but I didn't plan on uh, staying here that long and then when I bought this coat which is custom made. I I bought it during the pandemic. And so this is the first time I'm wearing it here in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have any idea that people would associate it with Santa Claus or <laughs> you know, the cross, which is over here in this region. And I'm taking photos every day. I mean, I take <laughs> five, sometimes I take 10 photos a day here. It just varies. And so, and you know, this holiday season just ended here, but every all, the whole season, everything just went by with this anxiety because again, this is people's homes and Mm -hmm. when you watch media i think some people are surprised when they see the videos that i capture myself because i also take video of myself running going about my routine because they because they think that the news cycle is our you know is these people's lives and nothing can be further from the truth and what is the difference between because obviously all of our news that we consume about ukraine here comes from cnn msnbc reuters al jazeera different 
different spots, the Associated Press, but almost all of them come at it from an American centric perspective, where you look at it, how it affects America and how it affects the things that we do in our economy. What is the difference that you're seeing as far as news reporting that the Americans use are not aware of or they're not paying nearly enough attention to? I think that's a good point. So first of all, here locally, everyone, everyone is focused on this um, military buildup across, the, you know, around the border, uh, across the borders. Um, and so so locally, people are paying attention to it for sure. I think the difference is that because people are looking at Ukraine through this Moscow lens often mm -hmm. because that's what the American media focuses on because there are vast differences between Ukraine and Russia. And because they look at it through this Moscow lens, they don't understand the culture of Ukraine. And the best way that I describe it is to a lot of Americans within our racial context, we look at Ukraine and Russia and you know, you, you think, okay, these are just two white people kind of going at each other and you know, and, and it's just vastly different. I tell people, you wouldn't do that no more than you would compare a Nigerian with a South African or an Ethiopian or a Senegalese person or a Congolese person, right? These places are, are very complex. And so the difference in storytelling that you see is that there is a lot of context that Ukrainians feel here uh, uh, that, that in, in regards, because they basically feel colonized. And so you see a lot of the, so, so, so a lot of the holes that we see in the American media aren't here because these are, you know, these people's lives. Mm -hmm. And I think what's also missing, you know, and, and going back to the, the context of colonization, um, you, you see this, this, this dynamic of, um, you also see this dynamic of fighting for media narratives. A few years ago, there are three television stations uh, that were, that were shut down you know, precisely because they felt, because the government believed that they were pushing propaganda and they were, right? And so keep in mind that because this country is colonized. Um, pushing Russian Russia, propaganda? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, because silly question, mind, but just. Russia, yeah. No, no, you're correct. No, 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 yeah. it's good that you're asking, right? And so there are, there are a number of channels here that were, you know, they're accused of, hey, pushing Russian propaganda and particularly language, right? And so what you have here is that you, have to make a decision of okay our country has been under the political jurisdiction of uh, uh, of the russian empire since catherine the great right which is basically 17 I mean, it's like the late 1700s like 1783 84 i don't want to get the don't put me on the court but it's around the late so it's like the 1780s that catherine the great took this country you know into the jurisdiction of of russia what well, basically it begins and they began you know, a Russification of it, basically meaning replacing R Ukrainian with Russian, um, displacement, repopulation, all those things took place. And then you came with, and then also came with Crimea, right? Because Captain the Great, they also came and conquered Crimea. And so people understand this context here. And so when so they- So it's very they, much a, almost like a, oh, here we go again type thing. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. People, you have this history in you. And so when you see my tweets, I'm giving you the context of this history. And to give you a sneak peek of an article that I'm working on right now, where I explain this, it, it's, you know, there are, you know, local journalists pay attention to what's happening in, in media, in, in, media in, the Amer in the United States. And so when you hear some people say, well, Putin has a point, that would be like, that would be like telling Palestinians that Israel has a point. Hmm. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, so right. when you break it down like that. So 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 it's it's like you are agreeing with a government that has this amount of you know military might like the the, the force and military and political will is just proportionate. And so because maybe you don't understand the history of our country, you're ignorant. You're you're, you're unwittingly giving this person a benefit of the doubt when they're just uh, engaging in the continuation of the imperial project of Russia. And this, this is a silly question. This is a Lance Corporal Kate <laughs> in the smoke <laughs> pit, curious question. Oh, why good. does, I know they've taken it over time and time again, but why, what's in it for them taking over Ukraine? Like, why do they want it? Like, why would they just people because and resources? Like what's the. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good, no, listen, no, you're asking, all your questions are good. Um, it's a rational question that, that is not congruent 
with a rational thinking person in Putin because it is it's irrational, right? That's a great Others, point. <laughs> right, right, Putin that, just that, Putin's, honestly. It, it's just, yeah, it's just Putin's mind, you know, it's insanity. Yeah. But ultimately, here's what you have to keep in mind. Crimea, Donetsk, and Luhansk, the people live horribly there. Yeah. Right, they live horribly. And even before the, now mind you, even before these occupations took place, people had a number of grievances with the Ukrainian government for a wide range of reasons. So did every other person around the country. For example, there could be grievances in America, but you wouldn't say Texas, you need to, you know, Texas should succeed or mm -hmm. all these Some of us would. I mean, it's I, I, listen, ridiculous I, down here I, too. I, 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 I get your point, but we're going to stay focused. Okay? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, we're, 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 all right, I guess let's keep going. We're, 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 we're going to stay focused, but, but, but I appreciate the levity, okay? So, <laughs> so, 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 but the thing about it is that for Putin to, if, you know, to invade, it, it, it's the way that an imperialist thinks, and that keep in mind that to, up until uh, mid, you know, spring of last year, there is a poll that found that more than eighty percent of Russians supported the annexation of Crimea, and so what's and, and so there's a lot of people in Russia who support this because they too have this imperial framework because mm -hmm. they are in a country that was colonized. When you think about Siberia, you know the cold, cold place mm -hmm. in the east of Russia. That was not originally Russia. That was indigenous land. So if you look at this, I, the way I explain it to people, which makes people kind of not know how to deal with me because they think I'm like this hog that's going pro pro, you know, uh, NATO, et cetera. America is a settler colonial state, just like Russia, mm -hmm. right? And so America displaced indigenous communities. Russia did the same thing, right? So much of the land and territory that is now Russia was never there. It was it was it was it was taken through colonial conquest, and so when you think about the mentality of how pe a lot of Russians view Ukraine, it is through this imperial mindset, which explains why you know I compare them to white people who are still grieving in the South because they lost the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. You know that's that's a pretty good analogy. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of Russians making made America great again, like they. Yeah. Russia great you know, again. They're, 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 yes, 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 yes. That, that, that is the framework. Now I want to tell you why you're not going to run into a lot of these conversations in mainstream. You're not going to run into it because one, just as America has this preoccupation with banning critical race theory in schools, even though it's not in schools, right? Even, right. even so, 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 so even though yeah. you have that, even though you have that dynamic in Russia, there is a suppression and reinvention of history that's been led by Russian President Vladimir Putin. And also with Crimea, when the, when the takeover took place, records, you know, all history and documents were destroyed. And so there is this remaking of history that centers the Russians, which is ironic because the Soviet Union, which birthed uh, Vladimir Putin, was a, was a union of all peoples, were supposed to be together. But if you talk to people here in Ukraine, They'll tell you, essentially, we felt like, you know, in many respects, you know, you had a few people who were exceptionally at the top of the poll, but there's this conversation, well, you know, there's this, the way that Putin talks about Ukrainians is ultimately, ultimately the equivalent of the white trash, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Georgia, if you go to the Caucasus, people will tell you that when I went to study in Moscow, I was treated like a dog. And so this equality that they talked about never existed. And so the, so, so the frameworks and media are you know that, that that are missing is this colonial context but because this field has been so resistant to having the conversations about race like any other you know the russia east european eurasian studies field just like the rest of america we're losing a lot of the key context to help us understand the motivations of people because just like racism it's irrational mm -hmm. right okay <laughs> it, 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 it's irrational and that's the same thing that's happening with putin and their treatments to ukrainians yeah, that's wow. fine. I, I always leave out. I always like assume there's like a reason for the reason somebody did it. And I like, I'm like, oh yeah, Putin's Oh, nuts. it's because you're a piece of shit. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's, Putin that's, sucks. That's, that's the reason. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, the way that, that's the way that people describe it. Yeah. 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 Um, a final question for me, just out of curiosity, I, I haven't traveled much besides, thank you, military to the Middle East a couple of times. Um, where'd you go? Tell me, tell me where'd you go. Afghanistan. Went oh, okay. to Afghanistan. Thank you for your service. Both, both oh, my parents. Thank you. 
I mean, I know, I know, but I just, but you know, I, I'm not saying it because I like, woo woo military. <laughs> it's just that my both my parents served. Ah. Oh. You know, so my mother, and, and you know, and I, 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 my mother served, and so she did 23 years. Oh wow! And uh, she did 23 years, and she was in the first. She, now she's obviously older than you. She did the first Iraq War. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. You know, and she did Bosnia. You know, after after the NATO strikes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right, and so she did a number of things, but I also write, but I focus primarily on nuclear weapons, okay. non-proliferation, but I have an interest just generally in the military, and I said thank you because I know there were a lot of, regardless of my critiques of the U.S. military and the military industrial complex, I understand and appreciate the sacrifice because it's just, it was a lot. And mm-hmm. so even with my mother, I'm always, I always that's just a reflex because I, because I, yeah. I have a, I'm a military mom, like I get it. Mm-hmm. Oh, we're having her on the show next, actually. We have a lot <laughs> to fine. ask yeah. her The whole star family's coming on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But really, I'm, I'm uh, mostly very unfamiliar with that part of the world. You've been going to Ukraine for years now and you spend many, you spend many months there out of the year. Can you just tell us like, what, what is what are the things that you love about it like what's the now what draws you what, to that what area draws you to that area yeah what do you well, thank you very much so in the summer i'm in the carpathian mountains and we call them the the uh the alps of ukraine per se even without the infrastructure and the cleanliness and the good roads and everything but <laughs> there's a bit of it <laughs> who it's needs it part. yeah who needs that right but i but it's a beautiful part of the country that I go to because it's relatively inexpensive and it's a great place to study and I enjoy the hiking. And so, mm-hmm. it, you know, and then also too, it's un, it's relatively untouched by tourism. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. I, so I, as opposed to going someplace in Western Europe, because the way I look at it is that everybody and their mama want to go to Western Europe and it's just common. I want to go to some place that is different and create my own imprint there and my own influence. And so that is what I enjoy about uh, traveling to this country. And also I enjoy Ukraine because, because they of this colonial history, I, I feel like there are a lot of parallels that I can draw with being a black American mm-hmm. and, and cellular colonialism, what that looks like. And so I love just traveling in my black body in this space and grappling with how oppression works and how the similarities flow with people who I originally thought in my American context were white, but when, but, but when you go outside of the American context and understand Ukrainians are their own ethnic group, just like, again, like I brought the example with Africa, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's helped me to really appreciate how complex race is from a global mm-hmm. perspective and how it functions. And because of that, I've been able to really bring a new analysis to understanding this conflict in ways that we can better understand it. And I want, and, and, and that in return is bringing new uh, research that's mm-hmm. bringing new perspective to this field to help us to resolve problems. And that's what I love doing. I like it, but, but beyond the hiking and beyond, you know, I'm also starting a tourism business here and obviously I'm not inviting people to come right now, right. but, um, Unless you but, want a but, discount. But, I'm sure you get a big yeah, discount. Yeah, a discount. Uh, <laughs> a discount. Yeah, but yeah, that's why we're going to wait in the fall, right, to the school <laughs> town and, and have a clothing line that I'm starting here. So there are a lot of things that I'm doing. A lot of people think that I have a, a wife here, which I don't, um, which, uh, which 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 surprises a lot of folks because that's one of the main things that a lot of Western oh, men Oh, if you have here. a secret with, wife there, there's definitely going to be a book made about you. Uh, God yeah, moves right. from Brooklyn to Ukraine and moves all around the... Which, the which, which, yeah, yeah, which, which is... Which, 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 well, I'm writing about this in my book about how I like this Ukrainian, the way this sex... Because to be honest with you, like a lot of the gay, the male gays that's, that's put on Ukraine is, is very sexist. I mean, just putting it out there mm-hmm. like that. But I write about it in my book. But just being a Black person, looking at all these things, is fascinating because a lot of times people don't know if I'm from the continent of Africa and when they find out I'm from America. You know, like I run into a wide range of stereotypes, but, I, but, but, the, but the crux of it is that I feel like I share something um, with Ukrainian people. And because I do and I explore this intellectual dynamic of conflict, of what I experienced in America and how they experience it here, 
it, it really helps me to, like I said, bring a new perspective to this region about yeah. how to solve problems. I'm happy that I'm making it look and I'm making the difference. And I, I feel really good about that, which is why I continue to come and do this and as well as enjoy the hiking and the other recreational stuff. Yeah. So if you want to check out more of what Terrell's doing, make sure you check out his podcast. It's called Black yeah. Diplomats. It's unbelievable. I've listened to some of your Twitter spaces and learned several things about Ukraine and what's going on. Make sure you're following him. He's at Russian Star uh, on Twitter. You can check all of his stuff out. Terrell, thank you so much. And we'd love to have you back again. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Hey, bring me on anytime I enjoy it. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, thank you. you.